Today we are going to talk about osteomyelitis, right? We will talk about its pathology as well as its <coughs> relevant clinical medicine, right? So first of all, what is meant by osteomyelitis? Osteo mean bone, mylos mean bone marrow, right? Itis mean inflammation. So what is osteomyelitis? Inflammation of bone and bone marrow. Right, so what is osteomyelitis? Inflammation of bone and yes, bone marrow. But it's almost always due to infective organism, right? So basically, it should be considered a infection of bone and bone marrow. Inf so what is osteomyelitis? Osteomyelitis is inflammation of bone and bone marrow which is virtually due to, it's almost always due to infective organisms, right? Most commonly these are either pyogenic or non-pyogenic. Non-pyogenic infection of bone or bone marrow. Now. Most commonly, either it is pyogenic or non-pyogenic. Pyogenic means pus forming. There are bacteria which are involved, microbes which are involved, which lead to the formation of pus. Is that right? And non-pyogenic organisms are those organisms when they damage the tissue, but they don't produce the pus. Now, in those microbes which produce pyogenic osteomyelitis, the most important and most common is Staph aureus. Staph aureus. In 80 to 90 percent of 80 to 90 percent of the culture positive cases are due to Staphylococcus aureus. Right? And then there are many other pyogenic organisms which I will discuss later in detail, right? But in the beginning, I just want to put in your mind the most common organism is? Say it loudly. Staphylococcus aureus, right? It's the most common organism. Why? It is, you need to remember that because when you start, when you suspect a case of osteomyelitis and before the culture and sensitivity reports come, you have to start the antibiotic therapy, empiric antibiotic therapy. In that case, the drug should cover Staphylococcus aureus. Right? Later on I will tell you, there are certain conditions in which we suspect some specific type of organism to be present more commonly. For example, later on I will discuss that patient with the sickle cell disease they can have osteomyelitis due to Staphylococcus aureus and also they can have osteomyelitis very commonly due to Salmonella. Is that right? In the same way, if I talk about the uh, osteomyelitis in adult and sexually active persons, it may be due to Neisseria gonorrhea. Right? So <clears throat> these special conditions and their associated micro microbe, I will discuss later. In the beginning, you just remember that most common organism producing pyogenic osteomyelitis is Staphylococcus aureus and most common organism which produces non-pyogenic osteomyelitis is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Mycobacterium, yes, tuberculosis. Even though there are other organisms as well, fungi can also produce Osteomyelitis, but again, most common organism in known pyogenic osteomyelitis is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And when Mycobacterium tuberculosis involves the vertebra spine, the condition is called POTS disease. When Mycobacterium tuberculosis, right, involves which bones? Vertebra, right, spine, then condition is called POTS disease. <clears throat> right now question is that bones are de usually deep they are covered by the skin 
and some soft tissue and a very important membrane which protect the bone from the infections that is periosteum if bones are protected so well then how the organism reach there how the organism produces inflammation there right it means how the next point which we should discuss that is that root of arrival of organism that how the organism reaches to target bone to produce osteomyelitis entry root of entry or arrival that how organism reaches a specific bone to produce osteomyelitis especially in children the commonest pathway is hematogenous right most common is hematogenous pathway hematogenous root it's common in children and it can also occur in adult right that organisms which produce bacteremia which produce bacteremia they may get entry into bone especially in children the most common part of the bone let's suppose this is a long bone and as you know in children this is a growth plate epiphyseal plate here is also epiphyseal plate right now in children long bones have special areas where bone is growing this part is diaphysis here it is epiphysis and this part of the diaphysis which is contributing to the growth growth of the bone this is called metaphysis right what is this diaphysis right and that part of the diaphysis which is growing it means the ends of the diaphysis which are growing in children growing children these are called metaphysis and upper part is yes epiphysis a little detail and here is yes articular cartilage here it is articular cartilage and here is a very tough membrane over it what is this membrane peri ostium right covering the bone again what is this membrane peri ostium and here in the diaphysis there is a in the shaft there is a cavity this is called medullary cavity where usually there is bone marrow right medullary cavity inside the medullary cavity it is also lined by a membrane and this membrane is not called periosteum this membrane is called endosteum what is it called endosteum right but what i want to specially mention that this part of bone here right and this part of the bone this is the growing part of the diaphysis which is just under the growth plate or just under the epiphyseal plate this part is yes metaphysis why i'm so much stressing on the metaphysis there is a reason for that in children the most common site in the bone to get involved in osteomyelitis is metaphysis later on i will explain why actually metaphysis has very peculiar type of blood flow and it has a very high high level of blood flow it's highly vascular right and later on i will tell you vascular arrangement here predisposes this part of the bone that bacteria which are circulating in the blood they love to settle over here especially staphylococcus aureus is that right so in children the commonest site in the growing children the commonest site for osteomyelitis is metaphysis. say it loudly metaphysis. metaphysis of course of the long bones right but in the adult of course when you are adult these growth plates disappear there's no more metaphysis and it's no more so vascular is that right 
but in adult also hematogenously from a distant site of infection bacteria can reach to the bone but in adult most commonly they involve vertebra they involve vertebra right am i clear so what did we discuss that what is hematogenous spread of infection to the bones it's more common in the children but it can occur in the adults also right where organism from a distant source sometimes from very minor uh, focus of infection minor skin infection like boils for uncles or peronychia inflammation related with the nail bed or tonsillitis or some infection in the lung the genito urinary system right or from gastrointestinal system right bacteria may enter into blood stream right and if bacteria are moving in the blood but not proliferating we call this condition bacteremia what we call it bacteremia bacteremia so from any focus of infection in the body bacteremia can occur and sometimes even from small mucosal breaches like very hard defecation and constipation or sometimes you are chewing very some very hard food that damages the gums or mucosal buccal mucosa so even such minor mucosal injuries can produce the breaches or cracks through which the bacteria can enter into blood stream bacteremia is a very common phenomenon right normally what happen when bacteria enter into blood flow reticular endothelial system phagocytose and eliminate these bacteria but if due to any reason if bacteria survive in the blood then they love to settle in certain areas in the body in case of bones of growing children bacteria love to settle in metaphyses and in adult they love to settle in vertebral bodies am i clear yes. any question up to this then route of entry one is hematogenous other is direct extension extension from neighboring soft tissue infections from neighboring soft tissue infections for example if someone has let me give you an example if i have some soft tissue infection in this area right initially maybe that staphylococcal infection or abscess is limited in the soft tissue but if it is not treated well maybe one day it damages the periosteum which is usually resistant to bacteria it protect the bone but if periosteal breach is there due to some neighboring infection then infective organism can enter into bone right classical example of this is ulcer in diabetic foot this is a typical and classical example what is that diabetic foot diabetic foot ulcer let me tell you what's wrong with diabetic foot the patient who have diabetes right they develop vascular disease as well as they develop damage to the nerves neuropathy right for example if a patient who has severe uncontrolled diabetes and he develops uh, atherosclerosis in lower limb vessels then naturally vessels will become narrow and blood flow to the foot will be increased or decreased decrease. it will be decreased right and this decreased blood flow will produce ischemia of the foot and you know when an organ is ischemic right can it defend itself against the microbes no, no. this is one problem in diabetic patients right there may be ischemia to the foot number 2 diabetes also damages the nerves sensory nerves motor nerves even autonomic nerves and if there is diabetic neuropathy in the lower limb it may result into loss of pain sensations right 
and if there's a loss of sensation in the foot, patient will inadvertently, repeatedly damage his foot and patient may not be aware of that kind of damage. Patient may not be aware that there has been injury to the foot and he will not take care of that and infection will easily settle. So if there is ischemia, at the top there is neuropathy and both will predispose the foot to more infection. At the top, in diabetic patient, WBCs, leukocytes, white blood cells are not very effective in phagocytosis of organisms and intracellular killing of organism. So what is happening? Foot is insensitive, right? Getting more injured, more breach of the skin, right? More entry of the organisms. At the top, due to ischemia, less blood flow going to the foot, right? So more, less antibodies and less white blood cells are going there. That further increasing the chances of infection. And then, more problem, that whatever leukocyte reach there, whatever leukocyte reach there, they are drunk with the high sugar level. They are dysfunctional leukocyte and they are unable to clear the infection. So what really happens? And many more problems. So in diabetic food, repeated injury and infection to the foot lead to ulcerations. Ulceration means a necrotic part of the skin sloughs off. And when there is foot ulcer, right, what will happen? Microbes will go, enter into that ulcer. And if that ulcer become deep, these microbes will reach to the bones of the foot and may produce osteomyelitis. So this is a classical example of what kind of osteomyelitis? Direct extension from the neighboring soft tissue infection. So in ischemic limbs and in diabetic foot, right, you can get osteomyelitis. Am I clear? Then, third more. Bacteria are directly planted into bone. Microbes are somehow directly planted into bone. They are directly inoculated. They are inoculating in the bone, direct inoculation, direct implantation of or plantation of what you can say of microbes into bone. What could be the example? Very simple, penetrating injury. There is a bullet injury, of course skin is compromised, soft tissue is compromised and if that has injured the periosteum organism from the skin may enter in. Is that right? So direct plantation, it may be penetrating injuries, penetrating injuries, then there can be surgery. During surgery, especially when you are doing, when you are doing orthopedic implants, right? When you are putting orthopedic implants in the bones, maybe unfortunately you plant the bacteria also there, right? Then compound or open fractures, if someone unfortunately get <coughs> severe trauma, an accident or some other condition and there is fracture of bones and hematoma of the fracture directly communicate with the skin and external world. We say these are open fractures. Of course, then bacteria can directly reach there. So what did we learn up to now? We learn osteomyelitis is inflammation of bone and bone marrow, but it is almost always due to infective organism. It may be pyogenic or non-pyogenic. Most common cause for pyogenic is staph aureus. And most common for non-pyogenic is mycobacterium tuberculosis and if mycobacterium tuberculosis is damaging the spine then it is called Potts disease. Then we talk that how these organisms reach to bone, bone and produce osteomyelitis. It's very important to know because number one bones are covered by skin and soft tissue. Number two specifically bones are covered by 
periosteum and these are resist they offer resistance for the osteomyelitis so due to any though how the organism reached there one is organism enter into blood produce bacteremia and blood vessels which are going to the bone organism reaches through that hematogenous spread second is direct is direct extension from nearby soft tissue infections and third is direct inoculation or plantation of or microbes in the bone marrow here i will again ask that if there is hematogenous spread in a growing children what is the short bones are involved long bones are involved or irregular bones are involved or flat bones are involved long bones, long bones. very good which part of the long bones metaphysis. metaphysis very good and in adult the most common site is for hematogenous spread vertebra any question no yes okay he's saying how do the bacteria destroy the periosteum uh, bacteria destroy the periosteum the way bacteria destroy many other tissues right very simple that they produce normally bacteria for example staphylococcus aureus they are producing highly damaging enzymes this is one thing secondly when uh, damaging enzyme is there initially if bacteria is outside the periosteum surrounding soft tissues damage inflammation occur neutrophils come and other macrophages come they also produce what enzymes. destructive enzymes oxygen free radicals all of them not only damage the bacteria or white cells the, if all this is happening in the vicinity or in the neighborhood of periosteum or for a very long time there's every chance they may damage the periosteum is that right periosteum is relatively resistant but not absolutely resistant to bacterial damage am i clear so that is why i'm saying that if there's soft tissue infection and it's not managed properly and this infection goes very deep and reaches to periosteum sooner or later it may damage the periosteum and start osteomyelitis am i clear any question up to here then one more thing that is osteomyelitis may be acute or chronic but that i will discuss into detail when i talk about clinical presentation right right now we will talk about that a classical case of osteomyelitis in a young child let's suppose we take an example there is a boy of it's more common in boys than girl uh, if boy of 6 year old and he develops osteomyelitis due to hematogenous spread of staphylococcus aureus in the metaphysis of for example tibia then once the organism reached there what are the biological events and what really happens there okay now we'll talk about that but before we go into that i would love to mention the blood supply of metaphysis <coughs> i will give very brief review of bone structure right so that we can discuss about pathological changes or morphological changes in affected bone during osteomyelitis as we discussed first we'll talk about the long bone and its little bit about its structure and its blood supply right because organism is reaching through through blood supply and later on we will see as separation or pus formation occur that pus formation further compromises the blood supply of the bone right so i will talk about briefly about the structure of bone right which we have already discussed this is a long bone what is here epiphyseal plate growth plate epiphyseal plate here it is diaphysis here it is epiphysis and here is medullary cavity and what is this metaphysis very good right now blood supply first of all from where the bacteria come how the bacteria come and why they settle here now we'll discuss into detail right let me draw this area in a magnified way this is epiphyseal plate right yes 
here is your metaphysis and here is diaphysis right now first of all about the blood supply the diaphysis has a nutrient artery the main artery which enters through the nutrient foramen right this is suppose nutrient artery and it is entering into bone and reaches which area is this middle ear cavity there it divides divides into two branches yes descending and ascending, ascending branch right now and from this descending branch and ascending branch some vessels are entering into what they are going to the cortex of the cortical bone and others are going to what is this bone marrow so it means the blood vessels are these are peripheral vessels right which are going to the cortical bone and these are the vessels which are central and going to the middle cavity they are supplying these vessels are supplying bone marrow and these are entering into cortex, cortex right and these vessels will supply inner two third of the cortex cortical bone right then this vessel will go upward it will give metaphysial branches it will give metaphysial branches and these metaphysial branches they will make multiple hairpin turn loops special type of loops i must draw them more clearly now as branches from this main artery they are approaching the metaphysis they reach just under the epiphyseal plate and then make a turn and with that turn these blood vessels drain into what are these sinusoid venous channels sinusoids and these sinusoids eventually become together and they go into venous drainage right and this venous drainage will go out now this is very important to understand this point this is a very special type of blood flow arrangement right let me make it larger here this is the growth plate here was the artery and it made the what was this hairpin turns here right now and then they were draining into sinusoids right now if bacteria was in general circulation for example it entered from a minor skin infection it was circulating here somehow it by chance reaches to this blood vessel so bacteria will through this nutrient artery will enter here and then it will reach to this loops and it will love to settle here yes why it will love to settle here not anywhere else why the reason is that due to the special mechanisms vascular pattern that when bl blood flow is rapidly coming here on this turn it become very slow is that right and because it is draining into very wide channeled sinusoids it is draining into very wide channel sinusoids so blood flow here become very slow and turbulent blood flow become very slow and turbulent and bacteria was floating into that now you imagine if there is a river and it's moving very fast water you are in the center less chances you will hit the sides of the river but if suddenly river become turbulent your chances to touch the wall are greater that is exactly what happens here that blood flow here suddenly become not only slow but also become turbulent so bacteria have more chance yes they have more chance to be long for longer duration present in turbulent blood flow and touch the endothelium and attach their right <coughs> right and attach their this is one reason right that bacteria settle over this area 
there is one more reason. Normally, if bacteria settle to some area, there must be phagocytic cells which should phagocytose and engulf those bacteria and destroy. In these area, in this part of the bone, there are very few phagocytic cells. So that less phagocytic activity in this area further increases the chance of survival of the bacteria. You got it? Number one, the blood flow pattern favors the settlement of bacteria in metaphysis. At the top, in these areas, phagocytic cells activity is very less as they are less in number. That also enhances the chance for bacteria to stay and survive and multiply. And at the top, especially Staphylococcus, it expresses some cell surface molecules which help this bacteria to stick the bone component. For example, in the bone, there's collagen, there's fibronectin, Staphylococcus aureus, and even some other bacteria express some surface molecules on their cell wall, <coughs> which help these bacteria to stick with the bone extracellular matrix. So all these reasons favor the bacteria to settle and multiply in metaphysis of long bones in children. Am I clear? So this is from where bacteria come? They come from maybe minor skin infection or sore throat or respiratory infection or urogenital infection, right? Sometimes or simple bacteremia due to some breach in or <coughs> GIT mucosa. And once bacteria survive in circulation, if they happen to reach over here, right? Then in the bone, in the metaphysical circulation, which is metaphysis is very vascular and at the top there is a hairpin turn where blood flow become very slow. slow and turbulent bacteria love to settle there right and then there is no more police there are no more police there no more phagocytic cells very active so they multiply there and then local environment is very loving because bacteria are expressing surface molecules which help the bacteria to hug the collagen and fibronectin stay there and multiply. You understand it? So this is the reason why metaphysial osteomyelitis is most common in children. But then what happens? Once the bacteria get foothold in the metaphysis, then what happens? Let's go forward. Bacteria, let's suppose I will show bacteria green. Now this is green bacteria. These are supposed staphylococcus. When they will multiply here, they will damage the local tissue. When they will damage the local tissue, then injured, damaged local tissue and bacteria, both of them will produce chemical mediators of inflammation and inflammatory reaction will occur. Right, as you know, blood flow will increase and, but specifically the first white blood cells which will arrive here are the neutrophils. So neutrophil will start, yes, arriving here. So what will happen here? There will be protein rich exudate with alive, dead and dying bacteria, alive, dead and dying neutrophils and after 48 hours, after some hours, <coughs> neutrophil will start calling macrophages. They will start calling, yes, macrophages. <coughs> and after a few days, even lymphocytes will come. So what is happening there? That bacteria started settling here. This was step number one and multiplying there. Then there was arrival the of neutrophils and then there was arrival the of macrophages right all these bacteria neutrophils macrophages all of them are producing fighting over there and producing destructive chemical substances and local tissue get damaged and local tissue is getting damaged right this will become an area where there's pus formation this will become a focus of suppuration suppurative inflammation what is pus Pus is protein rich inflammatory exudate. Pus is in protein rich inflammatory exudate having alive, dead, 
एंड डाइंग माइक्रो प्लस हैविंग अलाइव डेड एंड डाइंग ल्यूकोसाइड प्लस हैविंग अलाइव डेड एंड डाइंग लोकल सेल्स पेरेंट कैमल सेल सो पस इज फॉर्म हियर राइट इज अ वॉर जोन नाउ सो वंस फोकस ऑफ सपोरेशन फॉर्म हियर नाउ पस विल स्प्रेड If body defenses are unable to eliminate this bacteria, then this pus will spread. If this pus is going to spread, right? It will spread along the least resistance. Which pathways? Pathways of least resistance. It means we must know from where the pus from this area will go, and what it will do. One thing I want to make it clear. <clears throat> pus will not go upward let me show you focus of pus in this way right this is all pus here now first thing pus which is present over here it cannot pass through the epiphyseal plate why because epiphyseal plate does not have these metaphyseal vessels do not pass through epiphyseal plate there are epiphyseal vasculature also you understand there are epiphyseal vessels also there are metaphyseal vessels also but in a growing child who is more than 1 year old this vascular system does not have any connection with the epiphyseal vascular system and this cartilage growth plate is resistant to the action of relatively resistant to the action of bacterial or white blood cell destructive components due to this reason in a child which is more than 1 year old this pus cannot go up it cannot involve epiphysis right and if it cannot involve it cannot go up and cannot involve epiphysis then naturally it cannot reach to what is this articular cartilage if pus cannot reach here and it cannot reach here it cannot reach to the joint it cannot produce suppurative arthritis while passing through this route but children who are less than 1 year old this is important clinically to remember children or infants or children which are less than 1 year old in those children some metaphyseal vessels and epiphyseal vessels do have connections what is the importance of this it means if children are less than 1 year old even though infection may start at the metaphysis but it can go to epiphysis and it can destroy the articular cartilage and it can produce suppurative septic arthritis and damage the joint permanently it's very important to remember that in infants if there is osteomyelitis even though it's metaphyseal but it can go to you need to treat it very urgently and aggressively it can spread to epiphysis and eventually to the joint but children more than 1 year old until epiphyseal plate is there these two circulations are independent they are not on talking terms for example epiphyseal in long bones start closing this plate start closing at the age of 20 or 25 or 23 depending upon different bones in adolescence it start closing but from one year up to that age young adulthood adolescence and young adulthood until this is present over there metaphyseal infection cannot go through this plate to the epiphysis and the joint am i clear right so it cannot go to the growth plate then where the pus will go because as time will pass by more and more pus will be formed bacteria will keep on multiplying white blood cells neutrophils the macrophage will be recruited more and more local tissue will be damaged and pus will increase and pressure will increase in that side and now pus need to escape through through those anatomical 
pathways which are offering less resistance so it means we need to think what are special pathways here which offer the less resistance where pus will enter now what where the pus will enter let me tell you the microscopic structure of bone here right we'll study a little bit microscopic structure of bone here and then i will tell you pus will enter into special channels and canals now what are those channels and canals where pus can enter let me explain here a little bit already you have understood this that this was your nutrient artery right and then we talked about there was ascending branch and there was descending branch and then we talked about what were these metaphysical loops clear that is what you know very well but previously i told you from here vessels are going to the cortex bone cortex now actually here there are special type of arrangement which are bone is a bony substance is arranged in a very special way which is called osteons bone is arranged in longitudinal cylinders now what are osteons let me draw one osteon here let's suppose there is one osteon here right there is another osteon here there is another cylinder of osteon here and here they are multiple right now i will draw one of the osteon here to show what it is actually in center of the osteon there is a canal right around it what is happening that yes around it there is a canal in which there are blood vessels and nerves and lymphatics around it these are cells osteocytes <coughs> and this is the bone matrix what is it bone matrix. bone matrix right now now what is happening again there are osteocytes here what are these osteocytes and these osteocytes are embedded into bone minerals there is calcium phosphate hydroxy appetite you know these things right but inside it in this central canal there is a blood vessel along with this blood vessel of course there is uh, capillaries and there is venous channels there are arterial channels and there are capillaries and nerves around the central canal this all bone structure is there is that right now this is called this canal is called Heversion Canal. What is it called? Heversion. Heversion Canal because through this canal, blood vessel is going down. Heversion Canal. Right? And then in this area, I can show you more osteons or let's suppose this is central canal. Or we can show it here now right i will show larger in this area this is osteon multi layers and in the center there is what is this heversion canal what is this heversion canal what is this heversion canal right and these are Am I clear? Bones are arranged in small cylinders, right? Now, if I show you a version, uh, this, if I cut a section of it, how it will look? This is one osteon I cut. Now, these are its lamella. These lamella are around the hever, uh, central channel. So, these lamella are said to be concentric lamellae of bone. What are these? These are concentric because this is the center. They are concentric lamellae of bone. Right? And here. Now what is this? 
what is this canal you can see Evergen canal right and here are these lamellae am I clear I have made a section on longitudinal section that here are the horizontal section right now if I draw here one more Here is also Hevergen canal and blood flow. Now this is one channel, but actually these channels, they are connected on the sides. For example, from here I can show, on the side, they are horizontal connections, right, to the neighboring Hevergen. For example, from here, a channel is connected to this. This is central Hevergen canal, but there's a connection which is horizontal or oblique. This is called not Haversian canal. This is called Waxman canal. Upper these longitudinal are Haversian canal, right? And these horizontal or oblique interconnections are man canals. Is that right? Actually, blood is given to the all of them are interconnected. For example, it may be connected with this, right? This may be obliquely connected with that. You are understanding? Yes. Now, if I make it here, more largely, this is one Hevergen system. There is another other Hevergen system here or Osteon with Hevergen canals. Now, what did I show? This is the blood vessel here, is that right? And there is a blood vessel here, right? And they are interconnected through which? Waxman canal. Is that right? Now, from where the blood is entering into this system? Actually, these vessels. This vessel, this vessel is coming as Waxman. This vessel will come and supply the as Waxman and eventually enter the blood into Hevergen system. Is that right? Then, not only the blood is coming from medullary site, blood is also coming from periosteum. Let's suppose this is <coughs> periosteum. This is outer periosteum. Actually, main artery is nutrient artery, but there are many small periosteal arteries also coming. And these periosteum arteries they pierce the periosteum, enter into cortical bone, and then they also supply as Walkman. Do you understand it? Yes. So what is happening? From inner side, horizontal entry of the blood channels as Walkman, and from periosteum, Walkman. And these are connected with Hevergen canals, and they are also interconnected with Walkman. So in, this is how the bone substance in this bone is given the blood flow. Am I clear? Yes. Any question about this? Now, if I make it very simple diagram. Now we come over here in this diagram and we see, let's focus here. These are the Hebergen systems. Let's suppose these are Hebergen systems. Right? And what are these? Walkmans and from here, this is periosteal blood vessel. It is also giving what? Walkman. And then they are interconnected with each other. So this is the blood supply in this area. Of course, what should be here? What is this? Peri osteum. Right? Any question up to this? No. Now, as I told you, let's go back. I was telling as time is passing by, more and more inflammation, more and more separation, and it cannot cross to the epiphyseal, epiphyseal plate, then it needs to spread, yes, into Hevergen system, right? And this pus will even go in this direction and enter through Waxman system, and even pus will go outward through which through which pathway 
वॉक्समैन एंड गोड वेयर पेरियोस्टियम एंड इवेंचुअली सब पेरियोस्टियल ऑब्सेस विल फॉर्म वट विल फॉर्म हम सब पेरियोस्टियल ऑब्सेस विल फॉर्म बिकॉज नाउ पास एज डिस्ट्रॉयड द टिश्यू कैन रीच डायरेक्टली हेयर और पास थ्रू द हेवरियन सिस्टम कैन कम ओवर हेयर एंड द पास विच इज अक्यूमुलेटिंग हेयर इट्स प्रेशराइजेज और स्ट्रिप्स अवे द पेरियोस्टियम फ्रॉम द बोन सर्फे पुल द वे then periosteum is lifted away more damage occurs you know how the blood vessels which are going through the periosteum they are cut off blood supply to this part of the bone is cut off right so let's move <coughs> i will explain again this part that exactly what is happening there now you will rapidly review what we have done and then we'll move forward <laughs> we'll see as the progression of the disease as time passes by what really happens there yes there was the medullary cavity now rapidly which is this artery coming nutrient artery up and down and metaphyseal vessels right and these were the vessels going to the walkmans here was which ves uh, vessels periosteal is that right bone is a living tissue of course inside it what are these systems hevergen systems and what are these connections Waxman, is that right? Any question up to this? Here was pus started, right? It could not go up. Oh, we need to put the epiphyseal line. Okay, we'll put, take it off. You know that's the beauty of drawing as you want. So this is epiphyseal plate. Now pus cannot go up, right? What it has to do? But before we go for that, what is here? periosteum and what is here endosteum right what happened this pus entered into hevergen canal this pus damaged the bone and went into under the periosteum directly by destruction of the bone or through the hevergen canal and then walkman canal plus this pus went to the medullary cavity and in the medullary cavity again it entered to the cortical bone through walkman's canal eventually as time passes by there is a very big tragedy there the tragedy is this that this pus which was originally here now it has gone into hevergen system yes it has gone from here to which area walkman system and from here subperiosteum is that right yes. subperiosteal arrival of the pus is that right and from here also walkman so all these vascular channels pus is entering they are not expansile so all these blood vessels will be compressed all these blood vessels will be compressed and they will be destroyed and they will be thrombosed do you think blood circulation could be maintained in this part of the bone no so blood flow to this area will be compromised and this will produce severe ischemia this part of the bone this part of the bone will become severely ischemic why due to entrance of suppurative process in hevergen canal then walkman canal right leading to compression destruction and thrombosis of these vessels and severe ischemia of the underlying cortical bone am i clear and meanwhile pus has reached under the periosteum and it lift the periosteum of the bone and when periosteum is stripped away periosteal periosteal blood vessels these blood vessels are also broken away and blood flows 
is another source of blood flow is lost now blood is unable to enter from middle side which supplies the inner two third of the cortical bone and blood fail to enter from periosteal side which normally supply blood to outer one third of the cortex is that right and eventually this part of the bone this segment of the bone do you think it can live now without blood flow no so what will happen this will undergo very severe ischemic necrosis this will undergo very severe ischemic necrosis this will be a necrotic bone this is very dangerous bone you know why because on all sides it is surrounded by pus on all sides it is surrounded by pus and it is not connected with any vas functional vascular system and if it is not connected with any functional vascular system antibodies cannot come here even antibiotics cannot come here because antibodies and antibiotics need to come here through the blood and this is now not having circulating blood here so this is the area this dead piece of bone this is a dead piece of bone becomes the haven for bacteria because then bacteria multiply in this area and you cannot eradicate by just giving antibiotics or by having a strong immune system only antibodies and antibiotics cannot reach here and eliminate this focus of infection this is the point where we say osteomyelitis is becoming chronic it has become chronic and chronic osteomyelitis cannot be treated by antibiotics alone you need to contact the orthopedic surgeon you need to get this dead piece of bone out this dead piece of bone this is called yes it is a very special name who will tell me the name of this dead bone which need to be removed if patient need to be recovered this is called sequestrum c quest from this dead piece of bone is called sequestrum now you understand how the sequestrum form and why it forms how the vascular compromise occur so if a patient with acute osteomyelitis come and if diagnosis is delayed or appropriate or adequate antibiotic treatment is not done there is a chance sequestrum will form and biological system is not so helpless still we will fight system will fight against this what is happening here how the system will fight <coughs> in the periosteum in the periosteum a special reaction will come to help the situation actually as i told you first bacteria then neutrophils then macrophages and around after the seventh eighth day even lymphocytes chronic inflammatory cell come acute inflammatory cells are classically neutrophil with macrophages but later on macrophages with lymphocytes when this process convert into chronic and lot of chronic inflammatory cells are here they are producing cytokines these cells are secreting releasing cytokines interleukin 1 interleukin 2 and then there is tumor necrotic factor and many other substances for prolonged release of these cytokines stimulate the what is this periosteum and also <coughs> they stimulate the endosteum the periosteum which was lifted away and endosteum which was also stripped away right there are cells inside the periosteum and endosteum which are sleepy cells these are called mesenchymal osteoprogenitor cells what are these there are cells inside which are called mesenchymal osteoprogenitor cells these are mesenchymal cells not well differentiated but if they are differentiated they can produce the bone right so what happens 
when these chronic inflammatory cells are here and this constant irritation stimulation of what is this periosteum and endosteum and other living bone by the cytokines the cells mesenchymal osteoprogenitor cells which are abundantly present in periosteum and also present to some extent in endosteum, endosteum these cells are stimulated and these cells convert into bone forming cells they convert into osteoblast and they start releasing bone components what body is trying to do they are trying to make new bone formation what will happen there is new bone formation there was first event was separation then subperiosteal endosteal and haversian canal and what was this entrance into walkman's canal then we were left with here what was this yes sequestrum we were left with sequestrum then what happens periosteum which was lifted here it start doing a special thing and what is that start making the bone in the periosteum there were what mesenchymal cells progenitor cells mesenchymal osteoprogenitor cells which start convert into osteoblast and not only here this also occur then endosteum. endosteum so on both sides the cells become active and they start making new bone this is called reactive bone formation what is it called reactive. reactive bone formation this reactive bone formation which is occurring it will make a sleeve around this pus and sequestrum this is new bone formation it is attempt by our biological system to contain or limit the infection and also to strengthen the bone because after sequestrum formation this bone is dangerously weak it can can no more uh, support the body weight or it it doesn't have any strength you understand it so body is doing its fight so periosteum mainly and to some extent endosteum osteoprogenitor cells are activated converted into osteoblast cells and they start making new bone and there is new bone formation right <coughs> this new bone formation <coughs> i will make it red color this new bone formation this new bone right which make a sleeve or cover around the sequestrum and pass this is called involucrum what is it called involucrum of course now disease is getting chronic you cannot get this bacteria out you know when there is chronic osteomyelitis it's almost impossible to eradicate it sometimes even you cut off the limb it's very difficult to get it out we'll talk about its management later but what i'm trying to say it's very important that uh, if you recognize the patient in acute osteomyelitis stage in, within first few days give very aggressive antibiotic treatment i will tell you later that in different clinical conditions you suspect different organisms and different antibiotics should be given empirically and later on when culture and sensitivity is done then you do the exact appropriate antibiotic you are understanding otherwise there will be formation of sequestrum and and along with that involucrum right now we know why how the bacteria reach here and why they settle here and after that how they spread and they produce sequestrum and while the sequestrum is there subperiosteal abscess is also formed subperiosteal abscess was also here sub peri osteal abscess so subperiosteal abscess was there sequestrum is there and now involucrum is also there but whatever in involucrum is formed one thing you need to remember involucrum is like a it is not having any haversian system it does not have well defined osteons so it is not very strong bone even though it try to support but it is much weaker than the normal bone which has been lost 
Is that right? Now, as time passes by, right, passes there all around. Now, bacteria have made a very safe place for itself. And whatever you are doing antibiotic, whatever body is trying to fight, you cannot get that this nidus of infection out of, seed of infection out of here. If time passes by, what will happen? Eventually, subperiosteal, subperiosteal pus or abscess may rupture into soft tissue, into surrounding muscles, right? So what will happen? Number one, if there was subperiosteal abscess, that will rupture outside and eventually some part of inv involucrum will be digested by this pus and pus will come out through this to the soft tissue. You are understanding what is happening now? And this opening, this opening through which this pus has gone out, this channel is called cloaca. What is it called? Cloaca. So there is cloaca formation in which is a hole in the what? Involucrum through which pus is draining outward, subperiosteally and eventually into soft tissue. Are you getting me? Yes. And even through this cloaca and uh, the surrounding tissue, whatever pus is coming out, local tissue start getting damaged. And let's suppose here is the skin skin eventually this pus will make a pathway damage the local tissue and eventually it appear maybe surface of the it make a pathway while damaging the tissues it come to the surface of the body and from here the pus come out this is called this pathway from cloaca up to the skin through which pus is coming out and even sometimes sequestrum crumble and small pieces of sequestrum also come out. This pathway is called sinus. So eventually a sinus is formed. What is formed? A sinus is formed. Is that right? Any question up to this? Yes. Of course, uh, involucrum is not only infected. Main infection is in sequestrum and around it. Involucrum is a reactive bone formation, but of course some microbe enter there. But there a big fight is going on because involucrum has blood supply. And through that antibiotics or antibodies or white blood cells, new arrival of blood cell is going over there and fight is there. But this base is lost to the pathogens. Sequestrum is lost in the war. Is that right? And eventually they will make a tunnel through the sequest uh, involucrum, cloaca and subperiosteal area and pus eventually damages soft tissue very rapidly and eventually it drains out through the skin and there is a sinus formation. Is that right? And once the sinus formation occur, as time passes by, the skin epithelium, there is you know squamous cell epithelium on the skin, epidermis, am I right or not? This epithelium start growing inward. It start growing into the sinus. From outside, it start growing inward. And we say the sinus is lined by squamous epithelium. Sinuses, draining sinuses, eventually lined by squamous epithelium. Once it is epithelialized, it cannot close automatically. It becomes a permanent channel. Once it is epithelialized, it becomes permanent channel. Is that clear? So not only sinus formation, eventually epithelialization of the sinus occur. Epithelialization of sinus occur. So that simple bacteria we reached over here. What did it do? First thing, it settled over here. Why it settled here? Number one, blood flow was turbulent and slow due to hairpin turn. Number two, Phagocytic activity here was less. Number three, bacteria, especially many bacteria, including Staphylococcus aureus, express on their surface molecule which help the bacteria to stick with the extracellular component of the bone like collagen and fibronectin. 
Once bacteria settle here, they will multiply up at local separation. It cannot go through epiphyseal plate. But in children less than one year, there are vascular connections between metaphyseal vessel and epiphyseal. Then it can go upward. Or after the epiphyseal <coughs> growth is finished in adulthood, then even these two vascular systems again develop reconnections. In adulthood, once this disappears, these vascular connections on the epiphyseal side and uh, 